here at Smithy TV in downtown Toronto with Jeff Severe, a film critic, journalist, author, broadcaster on both radio and television, and many other things as well. What inspired you to get into the film critic business? Uh, I don't. Th I think it was probably because I really didn't have any other choice. Um, and I'm a, I'm a, actually a big uh, a fan for professional careers based on like complete obsession, um, because it makes the alternatives fall away pretty quickly if that's really all you want to do. And for me, it was very simple. You know, when I was when I was uh, when I was growing up, when I was young, um, the things that really kind of captivated me, like like a lot of kids, except I think more so with me, were things like television and movies, comic books, and that kind of stuff. Um, and so, uh, but it just kind of continued. There's a lot of people kind of grew out of those things or developed more casual relationships with these things. They remained for me um, uh, things of really intense fascination. Mm -hmm. And so that led me to, you know, really simply was, you know, I wanted to know more about, you know, things like music and movies that I really loved. And that would lead me to read about these things. And, and so the next thing you know, I'm kind of like, I'm going to libraries or I'm buying magazines and I'm kind of exposing myself to very interesting writing about film and music and popular culture. And so after I realized that, that actually it wasn't really in me to make films, that wasn't what my brain was all about. It was to kind of like uh, write about um, um, the response I had to movies and things like that. That's kind of how uh, that's kind of how it started. So I was very much inspired by um, a lot of the people whom I read at an impressionable age. But I was also, as I say, uh, it was as much kind of like obsession as it was inspiration, and I just kind of followed it through. Right. You've been in this business for decades now. Yes. Well, since the '80s and even before until now, how has being a film critic changed, and also how has it remained the same? Well, I think the biggest thing that it, that that has changed is, uh, first of all, sort of the, the sheer number of movie critics around, um, and I think that has an awful lot to do with both professional and kind of non-professional, and then that obviously has an awful lot to do with you know with the digital world and with and with the internet. Um, but I think that you know when I was. Um, when I was uh, became really interested in the possibility of becoming a film critic, um, the kinds of things that uh, film critics were doing were usually involved um, a sort of you know I was interested in what people were writing in kind of long form magazine pieces, and and that's the other thing too that's really important to remember is is at that point in time criticism was largely a uh, it was a it was a print phenomenon right you didn't have I mean I mean really very first movie critics on television I ever saw way back were Siskel and Ebert when they started, because up to that, you basically didn't see them. That's the other thing, too. And I think that what has happened uh, to that is I also think that the, the kind of the line between um, movie criticism um, and, you know, and basically movie journalism and movie marketing and movie promotion, I think those lines have really become blurred. Um, and, I, and what I mean by that is, is that I think there are a lot more people out there talking about movies, but I think they're talking about them in sort of a more excited and less kind of critical way. Now, I don't want to be, you know, nostalgic for the good old days or anything like that, <clears throat> because I've had kind of a long run at it, and I still continue to be sort of reasonably successful at it. But I do think that that has changed. I think that those kinds of like those voices of of real kind of substance. Um, and they're not necessarily, you know, academic or overly intellectual. I mean, the people that I enjoy, the Andrew Sarris's, the Pauline Kales, the Robin Woods, for example, of the world who were writing, brought a real intelligence. And what they did was they, they helped my understanding of what it was in a film that was making me feel a particular way. And the thing I always believe about movies uh, is that they, the, your first impression is always emotional. It's 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 not even conscious. It's not even intellectual. You are just, uh, you're engaged by the story. You're engaged by the performers. You are engaged by the color, the movement, that kind of stuff. And then you begin the process of thought. Then you begin to analyze. Then you begin to talk whether you talk about it or not. So what I always found with, 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 with those film critics was that they helped me to understand why I was experiencing, or perhaps not experiencing, um, emotionally what it was when I watched the movie. And I found that really valuable. And when you're in a world where people are basically going, you know, either it's awesome or it sucks or whatever, uh, you just, you're not really getting anything out of it except what you would sort of hear as you were exiting the movie theater at the end of the movie. And I just kind of like, I've always believed that film criticism can, can do more than that. Okay. 
what are some of the major factors that are that do emotionally affect us when we're watching a film initially? If you can speak to that a bit. Well, I think it, it has an awful lot to do with um, um, you know sort of our 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 capacity to um, invest a, a, a weird kind of belief in what we're watching, and I don't mean that that's that, that, that we are sort of fully um, you know hypnotized into hallucinating that what we're watching is real. But I think that what happens is that in order for a film to kind of engage our our, our <coughs> pardon me our uh, our emotional interest, we have to be able to project up to a certain level what it might be like for us to be in that situation. Mm -hmm. And if we can do that, uh, and, and, and obviously casting has an awful lot to do with that, performance has an awful lot to do with that, but also the kind of the, the means by which a, a film is made, uh, the momentum that it's moving at, the, the way the camera is is kind of you know carving up space, you know, are there a lot of shadows on the screen? Is it really bright? Um, what does all that color blue or color red mean on the screen? All those kinds of things affect us in a, on a very emotional level. And a very, very smart filmmaker is someone who is kind of manipulating all of those elements to kind of influence our sort of a, our, our emotional response. Um, so that's what I think, you know, and that's why we keep going. I mean, there, there have been a lot of other media, Katie, which have, have, have not lasted anywhere near as long as the movies have. The movies, you know, they said they celebrated their 100th anniversary like almost 20 years ago. That's really kind of amazing. And what that means is that it is a, uh, a medium that has a certain kind of appeal that I think touches us very deeply and continues to touch us. And these days now, even though we might be watching, you know, movies um, on our computer screens, on our tablets, on our on our our smartphones, there is still something about a story well told in moving pictures that is, I think, deeply compelling to all of us. And the fact is that anybody who has had a kid, or I would say maybe anybody who's been one, knows the experience of what it's like to just kind of like see that screen for the first time. Anytime you've ever seen a kid watching a movie for the first time, you realize, wow, this is something that hits us on a very primal level. What's your favorite movie of all time? Oh, that's that was a question that I was really hoping you wouldn't ask. Um, and <laughs> only, only because only because I, I really do believe that um, um, different movies influence us at different times in our lives for very different reasons. So you know, to kind of go through my own personal history, you know, I've always had a, a soft spot in my heart for an old Walt Disney movie called Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. And not because it's a great movie. In fact, I haven't seen that movie since I was probably five or six years old. But it made such an enormous impression on me. It made such an incredible impression on me um, uh, that uh, it was probably the one that sort of instilled in me a belief that I was born to do nothing else <laughs> but sit and watch movies. <laughs> so that was really important at that time. You know, later on in my life, um, you know, when I, I was I was like ten years old when I when I saw the the first Planet of the Apes movie, and I when I saw that movie, I thought, this is why this medium exists. <laughs> it cannot possibly get any better than this movie about a planet that is run by talking apes on horseback. Uh, it just and 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 I loved that movie, and I, I loved it, and I I was obsessive about it, and I would have dreams about it. Um, so that was a, that was also very influential. But then later on, you know, as I as I got kind of older, I do remember, you know, for example, when I was in one of my final years of high school, I saw Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver with Robert De Niro, and I, I it was one of the most intense emotional experiences I had ever had. I found the movie absolutely devastating. Later on, when I started to study film in university, um, I was introduced for the first time for some of the some of the kind of European art film classics. They made a huge impression on me. So I do believe that 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 that, that you know, to me, it's it's kind of like it, movies are my favorite medium, what my favorite movie is, and of course, Wizard of Oz. I mean, anybody of my generation that saw those flying monkeys on a television screen at a certain age um, was either completely captivated or completely destroyed by, by that vision for the rest of their life. So I do think that you know, and this is another thing that interests me with movies, is that movies always kind of intersect with our own personal experience. They're as much about what we bring into the theater as what's on the screen when we get there. And it is the combination of the two, who we are, where we're at, what we're thinking, what is the baggage that we carry into it that really, the, all of these things inform what I think is a very, you know, complicated experience, which is the experience of watching a movie. 
You have a number of published books out as well, yes. and you have one coming out soon. Can yes. you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm at work on a book now um, that I'm doing for Coach House Press in Toronto that I'm actually pretty excited about. Um, it's it's a it's a book about um, uh, the Hamilton. Uh, they were called a punk band at the time. It was Teenage Head, and uh, Teenage Head was a band that if you were at all interested in um, really loud, aggressive, fun, hard partying rock and roll in the late 70s or early 80s, and you lived anywhere in sort of southern Ontario, you saw this band. And if you saw this band, you probably went back over and over and over again. There was nothing quite like the live experience that was provided by these four guys from high school in Hamilton. And uh, they were poised to become probably one of the biggest Canadian rock acts of all time. But it never really came together for them satisfactorily in the studio. So as a result of that, it, it, on the one hand, it's a story about the band that, that, that never quite made it. Yet it's, it's the other, on the other hand, it's a story of a band whose legend has continued to persist over the years. So um, I, uh, what I'm doing is I'm uh, hopefully writing a sort of an account of a um, uh, an overlooked but really important and totally fun and great Canadian rock band. Okay. You worked at the Toronto Star as a critic from 98 to 2011 yes. and you've been more recently writing for the Globe and Mail in a right. column and you also just started uh, three websites. Yes. Tell yeah. me about what, why these websites are so exciting and what we can <laughs> learn on them. Well, uh, you know, it's, they're, 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 you, can, you can learn from them or you can not learn from them. That's the important <laughs> thing to remember. Hopefully you can read them for, you know, because, they're, because they're fun. One is called Mean Justice, and it is devoted to one of my particular obsessions, which is all things Western, Western movies, Western television, uh, Western TV shows. Uh, one is called The Big Shadow, and it's all about um, uh, crime movies and crime television. Um, actually, there's four of them. One is called The Directory of Intemperate Enthusiasm, which is a long word for cult entertainment. Uh, and finally, there's one that's called Riff Free or Die, which is all about uh, basically the history of kind of like rock culture, rock television, rock video, all that kind of stuff. Uh, what it does is it basically it allows me to kind of, you know, indulge in my obsessions, but also they're, they're, they're kind of ongoing encyclopedic projects. Um, and uh, they kind of allow me to sort of write about things I've always enjoyed writing about. And I mean, and, and my hope with these websites is that people can go to them um, and in, enjoy um, uh, what I hope is interesting writing about film, uh, what I hope is engaged and enthusiastic writing about film and television and music. Um, and uh, as I say, you know, if you learn something from it, great, but it's really more important to me that, you know, if you go to these websites, um, that um, you find something there that is engaging. Because for me, uh, it's all about trying to create something and write something that hopefully uh, can be, you know, as, as interesting as the things I'm writing about. That's, that's my goal, you know, constantly. And where do you expect film criticism to be moving in the future, in the next few decades? Well, that's a really interesting question. I mean, certainly what, what, what you've seen in the last 10 years is a real kind of sort of war of attrition with print critics especially. Um, a lot of uh, people have lost their jobs. Um, I mean, I didn't lose my job at the Toronto Star, but one of the reasons why I left is because I, was, I, would, I could no longer work there as a critic, and that meant that basically there was no point in staying. So I'm very, very grateful to the Globe and Mail for offering me a column about movies, which is what I you know, kind of think I should be, I should be writing about. Um, but I think that, that, that what it's going to probably find a, a, a new level. I would like to think that, 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 the, that the kind of the cheerleading, the not terribly informed, uh, and, but often really opinionated kind of fanboy criticism that's out, out there will, uh, will kind of taper off. Or if it won't taper off, it'll, it'll at least be complemented by a sort of what I think, hope is a more measured and I think more skillfully written form of, you know, of movie criticism. I would hate to think that I'm kind of like you know, the last person standing of a particular generation. I know that some film critics feel that way, but I don't think so. Um, I think that you know, as long as people see movies, um, take them seriously and take them at least seriously enough that they feel kind of compelled to put their thoughts down. Uh, and to, as I say, kind of engage with the movie and to create something, you know, that is not just about their opinion, but hopefully might engage other people, then I think, you know, there is going to be something like film criticism um, around, hopefully, for, because the movies aren't going to go 
away, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would like to think that this is going to be some future for what I do. Okay. And where is the best place to find out more information on you and on your work online? Oh, well, um, the, um, you know, I, there's, there's a Wikipedia entry on me which you can go to which has, the, um, which has all of the uh, websites, all of their addresses there. Um, and there is also a, uh, a Jeff Pavir website as well which will direct you to all of these websites. And I, I really do hope people get an opportunity to take a look at them. And obviously, as I say, you know, feedback is, uh, is essential. You know, one hates to do this kind of stuff in a vacuum. Okay. Thank you so much. Congratulations on Thank all you. of your success. And I look forward to reading more of your work in the future. Thank you, Katie. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks. I'm Katie Ellman reporting for Katie Chats here at Smithy TV in downtown Toronto.